Genius series is one that is critically acclaimed. A series of complex JRPGs with incredibly deep stories and beloved characters. Yoko Taro being the legendary director behind it, working alongside Toy Logic, have produced an updated version of Near Replicant. Previously only released in Japan, I personally love when games are released to Western audiences, as it feels like we can really miss out on some content occasionally. That being said, though, the West did get Near Gestalt, which has various visual and writing differences, but it's mostly the same game, just with an older protagonist. Now, this series is far too complex for me to break down here in this review. So what I'm going to do is post some links in the description of trusted lore YouTubers who have done a splendid job mapping out the timelines for people like myself who need to brush up before playing the games. Please show these YouTubers some support. They provide such great content with a high level of care in their work. And with that being said, let's move on to the review. Let's break it down. Graphics. So right off the bat you'll probably notice that the game has an antiquated look. As previously mentioned, Near Replicant was released in 2010 and it was a Japan only game. Toy Logic have done a great job updating the visuals for the game. It's not perfect and it has a few low resolution textures here and there, especially when you're traveling through the game world. But there's a really great comparison video and I'm going to link that in the description. So if you want to check that out after the review, you can do so and you can see that the animations for the characters in the newer version are so intricate and detailed when running at 60 frames per second it's really amazing the stylistic combat made me feel like i was playing a platinum game positioning myself behind an enemy with a carefully executed sidestep made me feel like i was in a shonen anime followed by a barrage of magical abilities which in the upgraded version of replicant looks stunning and i often found myself activating magic for the sake of it i loved the work behind it and it was only amplified by the 60 frames per second combat as a standard having characters pull off grandiose attacks in the middle of a cutscene can be quite taxing for your system and for the devs who have made the animations. Every cutscene flowed so naturally with these animations that I sometimes forgot I was playing a 10 year old game. When it comes to the main cast the characters, the upgrades are most certainly impressive and for all you Kainé fans out there, you most certainly know what I mean. The facial animations depict the characters very well. In emotional cutscenes, you can really feel the gravity of the situation. And come to think of it, it must have been pretty difficult to portray this level of emotion needed to convey a certain feeling 10 years ago. So having an upgraded version to relive those scenes struck an emotional chord in me. At the realization of how great the visual update was, I was definitely smiling from cheek to cheek, unintended. Unfortunately, the side cast of characters is uh, so-so, but that is to be expected from from a 10 year old game. Near Automata was vastly different in terms of its color palettes when compared to Near Replicant, the former having a more washed out grey and black look and the latter having a more distinctive and colourful palette. Every shade that wasn't grey or black seems to have been tweaked and brought to life in this modern day version of Replicant. This is especially apparent when using magical attacks that bring the combat to life with a slew of neon colours that traverse your screen helping you recognise what phase of combat you're a display which can be considered bombastic at times but in the near setting the colorful symphony works so well in contrast with the world setting i absolutely love it spinning scythes, giant fist punching, infernal spikes emerging from the pits of hell, how about a doppelganger that cleaves your enemies for you, or do you fancy something a bit more defensive, let's talk about a barrier that absorbs your opponent's magic, or a bubble that literally makes you immune to everything, no I didn't think so, you want giant spikes and a barrage of virtually infinite magical bullets don't you, well the good news is you get all those things and you can swap them as you wish, in battle, out of battle, at your grandma's house, doing your groceries, or maybe perusing the latest lingerie for your newest companion Kaini. This switching of magic really allows for flexibility in combat and in some cases I've used spells to help me get through the game's puzzles that are dotted around now. Don't get me wrong, these are no Ocarina of Time or Phoenix Rising puzzles but these spells helped get the job done. In fact, one spell in particular really had me coasting through the game's harder enemies. And in the interest of keeping your playthrough challenging, I'd maybe not use a Dark Wall spell as much as I did. I recognised quickly that it was OP and lent on it a lot. Another great thing about the combat here is that you can intertwine these spells with your regular attacks, often unleashing visceral attacks one after the other, never giving the opponents time to rest. Throw in some parries and you're basically a god. It's something I didn't always feel when I played Automata. There's definitely an emphasis on magic for this game, but the weapons I've not 
nothing to scoff at too. You have swords, two-handed weapons, spears, which you can instantly switch to after tweaking a setting in the options menu. You have your standard set of moves, light attack, heavy attack, jump, guard, roll. You mix these in with charging magic spells and dash cancelled, and you'll be so immersed in the combat, and whenever you're out of combat, you'll be waiting for your next fix. Speaking of that though, one of my favourite moves is sidestepping, which swiftly repositions your character behind the enemy, leaving them confused for a second as they wonder why they have a sharp sword perforating their spine. You can then amplify those things I mentioned using words, which act as special modifiers. They will add values like more attack power, more magic power, elements like poison and paralysis onto your weapon, or maybe they'll get you more XP or buff your item drop rate. You can apply these words to magic, weapons, or even simple actions like guard and evade. These words can be pretty powerful as you go along in the game and there's tons of them. And to give you some perspective, after finishing two of my endings, I only had about 60% of them. Next up, quests. I'll be frank that most of the side missions are fetch quests. They are incredibly mundane and had me falling asleep as I was going from one area to the next looking for goat meat. There are probably only a handful of quests that are actually useful and without giving away too much, if the quest sounds like it involves a side character, it's probably a good one to do. You'll get an item and more XP most of the time, otherwise all of other side quests are pretty pointless. In fact, if you want to make some money, you're better off visiting the junk heap and collecting parts from the enemies there. You'll also get drops, which will assist you in upgrading your weapon, so it's a win-win situation. The main quests, in contrast, are thrilling and kept me on the edge of my seat for most of it, especially as you're completing the game multiple times and in true near fashion you get to see things from a very different perspective every time you go through. I highly advise multiple playthroughs and the first playthrough will take you about 20-ish hours and to see all the endings it's probably closer to 60 to 80 hours. writing and story. You play as Nia, a young man who is a brother to a girl called Yona. Yona, suffering from a disease, Nia ventures out into the unknown to seek out a cure for his sister and as a part of the journey he comes across a fairy tale which depicts a special tome capable of healing any disease. Insert Grimoire Weiss, voiced by Liam O'Brien. And I have to say he did an amazing job. I actually laughed out loud on several occasions from the hilarious over the top rolling of the R's I, Grimoire Vice. To the perfect retorts to conversations in the game, I absolutely loved it. He was by far the star of the story if you ask me, bringing another layer of complexity to an already dated formula. With JRPGs being so tropey, having great writing and a voice actor that can really elevate the writing work serves to put games on the map and define legacies. I also want to give a shout out to Laura Bailey who plays Kaine in our story. She portrayed a strong warrior battling with identity insecurities and a troubled past almost perfectly. The voice of Laura Bailey highlighted the struggles of Kaine, gave her grit, elevating the story when other tones fell flat. The combination of Laura Bailey and Liam O'Brien as Grimoire Weiss and Kaine carried the story to its conclusion, leaving a pleasant aftertaste and fond memories, often making me chuckle when thinking back to the interactions. I wish the same could be said of the main character and his sister, but to be very honest, they are quite bland and not my cup of tea. And as someone who is very into tea, this is a big deal. Ask Spiffing Brit if you don't believe me. On a final note though, I think it's important for me to mention that the game requires multiple playthroughs to see every perspective, and in my opinion, it's worth investing your time into. You'll really get a lot out of this game and trust me, it's totally worth it. How does it run? Well, this is a classic Square Enix port unfortunately, so there are a few things that bugged me as I played through the game, no pun intended. First of all, for those who have ultra-wide monitors, you'll suffer with black bars as the game hasn't been formatted for ultra-wide yet. Secondly, my game can't decide whether it wants to speed up or slow down. But Alex, what do you mean by that? I mean that when the game is running above 60 frames per second, the internal logic clock speeds up the game so that you match your FPS, which means you'll be running around like Sonic the Hedgehog on speed. For some people, this isn't a big deal, but how about if I tell you that with these ups also have downs? I mean, literally, dropping my frames down to 36 and below, sometimes scraping into the 10s, and it's not a blue moon kind of situation. It happens every time you enter an area, and 
and you're about to fight a boss. This makes playing unbearable, especially when you're relying on frame perfect parries and dodges. It was the same in the Automata on the Steam Market and it's the same here. Now there is a temporary fix which involves you setting your frame limit to 60, reducing the speeding up in most frame drops. Now the FPS issues were still there, they just weren't as frequent. Now if we need to go further you'll find that this game also eats up a lot of memory. So if the frame drops become too frequent after the temporary fix, you may need to restart your game in order to free up that memory. Ultimately though, it's down to Square Enix to fix this common problem with their ports as it's a consistent issue causing troublesome issues all the way through and no one wants to wait 4 years to get a patch to fix it. I was playing on an i9 on a 3080 at 4k and I fluctuated between 60 and 80 fps when the game was running smoothly. I also turned down my shadows to medium to create a more stable experience. But again, for a game that has been remastered from a game that is 10 years old, this really shouldn't be happening and I hope to see some future improvements in future ports. That's the only way. Keiichi Okabe, you have gifted us some of the greatest soundtracks in video games and I'm so thankful there are composers like you. The sound design of any near game is tremendous both in style, elegance and theme. Every soundtrack buzzing with atmosphere. This may sound pretty geeky but I actually have the Weight of the World prelude version from Fun Fantasy XIV downloaded onto all my devices. It's an absolutely badass soundtrack and the combination of Yoko Taro's direction and Kichi Okabe's excellent composing can leave you feeling ecstatic after every fight. It's not all up-tempo tracks. There are some serene and mellow tracks that play as you enter peaceful areas, seamlessly queuing up as you get closer to the local bard. It was a tantalizing experience for my ears and playing on surround sound or a decent pair of headphones is definitely advised. The sounds of weapons slicing swiftly through the air or the audible thumps of my two-handed sword coming down and crushing the opponent's armor are so well done it feels responsive purely from the sound design perspective. The sound even changes as you walk into different areas with the acoustics being in line with the architecture of the levels. Sound plays such an important role in connecting us with the games that we play and the emotions that we feel. It often plays an understated role, whether it be Nier, Halo, Final Fantasy, Kingdom Hearts, Persona, all of these games and many more are celebrated for their excellent sound work among other things. With technology being as advanced as it is, I can't wait to hear even more of these beautifully crafted soundtracks from these titles and more. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the review. As always, I enjoyed making it. Nier's just one of those series that stands up there with the greats. Persona, Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy, and so many more. These are games that are beloved by the entire JRPG community, and it's easy to see why. The attention to detail is second to none, and in my opinion, it's one of my favorite genres, and I think people should invest some time into it so we can see more great releases in the West. Now, you can find this game on PS4, Xbox One, and Steam. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a green light, so if you don't know what that means, stick around. On the next slide, it's going to show you what that means for future reference. Guys, I'm really looking forward to all the future reviews. The next one up is Returnal, and then we have Resident Evil Village. I hope to see you there, and thank you so much again for your support, and I'll see you on the next breakdown. Bye.